So we're now coming towards the end of our journey through the Bible. And this is the stage where if I was on an actual holiday or some sort of trip, well, I'd sit down with a coffee uh, and I'd begin to chat about maybe some of my highlights and some of my favourite parts of the journey so far. If I was to do that tonight with our journey through the Bible, uh, well, I might even make a comment about the length of some of the journeys uh, that we've made. Sinai to Jerusalem, well that took hundreds of years, as did Jerusalem to Babylon and then Babylon to Golgotha. We've covered a lot of ground together as we've moved through the Bible. But the good news is that tonight, well our journey from Golgotha to Pentecost is a very, very short one. In fact, it only takes a few weeks. But those few weeks, well they're some of the most important and vital weeks that the world has ever known. The journey takes us from the earth-changing day at the cross to the Jewish festival of Pentecost. But the first thing we have to do before we think about that is to hit rewind and to check out some of the prophecies that are given during that exile in Babylon. I asked you guys a couple of questions online this week um, and I got a few responses. The first question was, what's something important that you remember being told when you were younger? Um, Scott uh, chipped in with the classic, do not eat yellow snow, which is a funny answer, but also really important information. Um, Laurie Campbell, uh, he said he remember, remembers being taught uh, by his mum that worries are like tomato plants. If you water them um, and you allow them to grow, then you'll be eating tomatoes for the rest of your life. So that idea of, look, if you continue to worry, well, then worry is all that you will do. Um, and I can remember my grandparents had some great advice for me when I was a kid. Um, but the main one was my granddad would always say two things. One, there's no such thing as a stupid question. And two, if you don't ask, you don't find out. The reason why I asked that question is because, well, in order to understand what's going on at Pentecost, we need to look back at some things that God's people were told long ago. We will understand the importance of what's going on at Pentecost, but only if we go back to the book of Ezekiel and we think about some of the prophecies that we find there. So what were the prophecies in Ezekiel? The first prophecy we see in Ezekiel is judgment of unfaithful leaders. It seems the leaders of God's people back in those days, well, they were selfish and they just did what was best for themselves. Because the leadership was poor, in fact, you could even say it was evil. The people, well, they were all in danger. Look at what we read in Ezekiel 34 verses 5 to 6. My sheep have been scattered without a shepherd, and they are easy prey for any wild animal. They have wandered through all the mountains and all the hills across the face of the earth, yet no one has gone to search for them. Ezekiel makes it very clear the shepherds are not doing their job and the people, well, they're in trouble. So God tells Ezekiel that he's going to step in. God will do the shepherding himself. Where we have failed, God will step in and succeed. God says, I will be like a shepherd looking for his scattered flock. I will find my sheep and rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on that dark and cloudy day. I will bring them back home to their own land of Israel from among the peoples and nations. I will feed them on the mountains of Israel and by the rivers and in all the places where people live. Why will God do this? Well, he says in verse 23 that he will place one shepherd over them who comes from the line of David. So there's our first prophecy. God says that a shepherd is coming from the line of David and he's going to bring his people back together. The second prophecy we find is about a heart transplant. Ezekiel 36 speaks of God gathering his people together again, but it goes on to tell us what God will do. God says in Ezekiel 36, 24 to 27, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. Your filth will be washed away and you will no longer worship idols. 
and I will give you a new heart and I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. And I will put my spirit in you so that you will follow my decrees and be careful to obey my commands. We've seen over these last few months together in our studies the damage that sin has done to our hearts. We just aren't capable of living for God or obeying his law on our own. So the only solution is to remove our sin sick hearts and to give us new ones. We all need a heart transplant, which is the work of the Spirit of God, who we read about in Ezekiel 37 in our next prophecy. Our third prophecy, well, it's about dry bones resurrected. I'm going to read um, Ezekiel 37 verses 1 to 14. So if you've got your Bible, um, open up with me. Um, and let's read this passage together. The hand of the Lord is upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. And he led me around among them, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy over these bones, and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you. And you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a sound, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked and behold, there were sinews on them and flesh had come upon them and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me and the breath came into them and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will put my spirit within you and you shall live and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken and I will do it, declares the Lord. What an incredible passage of scripture. But what does it mean? Well, the dry bones basically sum up the people of Israel. They're scattered, they're dead, and they're without hope. That is until God acts. God is going to gather them back together and bring them back to the promised land. He's going to lift them from death to life. And the climax of this passage is found in verse 14. God is going to put his spirit in them and give them life. The breath Ezekiel breathed in the vision is the same word as the word spirit. And it should point us to the breath or spirit of God that fills his people in order to change them and give them life on the inside. Immediately after this passage, we also have a prophesy of the divided north and south of Israel being reunited together. And so if we take these three prophecies and we think about them together, here's what we should see. Christopher Ash says, We see that the gathering of Israel, which is itself the beginning of the reversal of the scattering of Babel, will only happen when the Spirit of God is poured into the hearts of the whole people of God. Gathering cannot happen without the Spirit. So how do we receive the Spirit of God and how do we get this reconnection with God again? Well, you could answer that question in two words really, the cross. The only reason that we can have the Holy Spirit living within us is because Jesus came to die on the cross and then rise from death to life. But maybe that brings a question to your mind. Why the cross? Why did Jesus actually have to die? Couldn't God have just poured out his spirit and gathered his people together without the cross being necessary? Well, John's gospel helps us to see the answer to that question when we read John 1, 29 to 33. 
The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is God's chosen one. John, well, he tells us that Jesus is going to baptize with the Holy Spirit, which means that Jesus is going to pour the very presence of God into the hearts of those who put their trust in him. The only reason that Jesus is able to do this, though, is because he is the Lamb of God who has come to take away the sin of the world. Jesus can only pour the Spirit into our hearts because of his death and resurrection. John, well, he makes that clear to us in John 7, 39, where we read the phrase, up to that time, the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. The Spirit would come to God's people when Jesus was glorified, and Jesus was glorified by what he did on the cross. Christopher Ash says the reason the Spirit could not be given until Jesus had died for sinners on the cross is that if God came into an uncleansed human heart, he would destroy us. Because he is the Spirit of God, he is the Spirit of utter, all-consuming holiness, the Holy Spirit. And holiness will destroy us unless our sin is cleansed by the cross. So, because of what Jesus did at Golgotha, will we come to Pentecost, the reversal of Babel. You see, after Jesus had died and been raised from the dead, he tells his disciples to wait for the outpouring of the Spirit in Acts 1, verses 4-5. We read these words. Once when he was eating with them, he commanded them, Do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised, as I told you before. John baptized with water, but in just a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. The second question I asked you guys online this week to have a think about is the question, what's something that you look back on as being worth the wait? Uh, and I'm sure, to be honest, we've all had moments that we would say something was worth the wait. Um, it could have been exam results at school, uh, and when you finally got them, they were pretty good, so you kind of thought, that was definitely worth the wait. It, it might be a parcel that you ordered, uh, and you get those dreaded words that says, look, this could take three to four weeks to come. And so you wait patiently until finally, there it is, and you're so excited to have it. It could be a TV show um, or a movie that is coming out soon that you just cannot wait to see. I am super excited for the new season of Line of Duty that's coming in the next few weeks. We all know what it's like to wait for something and for it to be completely worth the wait. And for the disciples, well, waiting in Jerusalem was beyond worth the wait because the gift Jesus was given them was the very presence and the very power of God in them and with them. We read about what happened in the book of Acts, so grab your Bible again. We're going to go to Acts chapter 2, and we're going to read verses 1 to 8. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each one of us in his native language? Picture the scene for a moment. We have the disciples gathered together in one place. But look at what we're also told. Staying in Jerusalem at the same time were God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. This crowd of people from so many different places would never have had a chance of being able to understand the disciples, no matter how hard they tried. See, humanity, well, they were still living in the shadow of Babel. The confusion of human language was still with them, and it was a terrible reminder that they were living in a world outside of Eden. However, wonderfully and surprisingly, the confusion of languages is briefly and miraculously overcome. Christopher Ash says at Babel, the people sang their own praises and so became incomprehensible to one another. At Pentecost, they sang the praises of the one God and so began to understand each other. 
this kind of reminds me of being in Asia in 2019. We had the opportunity to go to one of the local gatherings uh, on one of the Sunday mornings we were there. As we arrived, well, we took our shoes off before entering the building. Uh, and all we could hear as we were taking our shoes off uh, were people singing and praising God. Now, they were singing in their own language, but we could tell by the tune that they were singing How Great Thy Art. And so well, we joined in in English. And it was this special moment. Here we were, people from the other side of the world, and yet we were together with our brothers and sisters praising the same God. We were separated by many things in our lives, but we were brought together by the power of Jesus. And the amazing thought is that one day we will understand one another perfectly. People from all over the world will be singing the praises of God and of the Lamb forever around the throne. What happens at Pentecost? Well, it's a shadow. It's an anticipation of that great day that's still to come. As the people listened on uh, and were able to hear the disciples speak in their own languages, they were amazed and they began to ask, what does this mean? And so, well, Peter took his opportunity and he preached to those people and shared the gospel with them. As they heard the gospel, the good news of Jesus, well, the next question they asked was this, well, what should we do? And in summary, Peter's answer is this, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Christopher I says the gospel gift to the Spirit of God given to every forgiven man and woman will we gather the scattered people of God and bring them together as one. He will remake a broken world. Indeed, if we continue to read through the book of Acts, will we see how the good news of Jesus begins to spread across the whole world, reaching people from every tribe, tongue and nation. We can see for ourselves that God's promise will it is actually coming true. A world torn apart by sin and pride is being gathered back together and it's being gathered under Jesus.